I would make the writing more simple. That was, I did a bunch of changes that would make the writing more simple than it was because it was unduly complicated. Um, I made the writing more clear in, in places where it was confusing or baffling or just somehow difficult to understand. The third thing I did, I, was make, I would make the writing more elegant, by which I mean, I would make it flow more nicely. And the fourth thing I did, I also made it more evocative, which just means, you know, more moving or more, uh, more visual. So in order to evoke people's imagination or their emotions. If everyone want to turn on the camera or update your name, that would be great so we can see you. All right, let's get started. Uh, mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending today's PDF webinar. Uh, my name is Frankie Gunawan, and I'll be the moderator for the event tonight. The topic for today's talk is how to become an exceptional writer. But before we start the talk, I just want to give a quick introduction to PDF for those of you who might be new to us. Is anyone new to PDF for, for tonight? Oh, welcome. Right. Uh, at PDF, we believe that Everyone, not just the elite few, should have access to the right tools, techniques, and network to develop themselves. We believe that by becoming the best version of ourselves, we will all live more fulfilling life and inspire those around us to do the same. And we do this by running events that aim to inform, connect, and inspire. And then we share what we learn with our community on social media. I also want to quickly acknowledge our dedicated group of volunteers at PDF who are here with us tonight. Thank you very much for everything you do. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to lay down some housekeeping rule. Uh, please note, this is a recorded session that may be distributed by social media at a future date. And finally, if you have any questions during the talk, please feel welcome to type them into a chat box at any time. When we get to the Q&A part of the session, we will invite you to ask your questions. All right, we'll aim to finish by 8 p.m. tonight. And tonight, we are lucky to have Shani Raja with us as our special guest. Now, a little bit about Shani. Until recently, Shani was a senior editor at the Wall Street Journal, which, as many of you know, is one of the world's biggest newspapers. At the Wall Street Journal, Shani was also responsible for training many of the paper reporters and the editors in Asia to help them take their writing to the highest level. During his 20 years career, Shani also written for several big news organizations, including uh -huh. The Economist, Bloomberg News, and The Financial Times. Recently, however, Shani decided to leave journalism to become an online instructor. And he has since become a very successful one. Right now, he has close to half a million students worldwide on platforms such as Udemy and LinkedIn. Shani course basically teach people how to write with the style and flair of the world's best journalists. And today, Shani is going to share his secret formula with us. So if you are ready to discover the secret source of great writing, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Shani. Thank you, Shani. Thank you, Frankie. Can you hear me well? Yes? Yes. Good. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm always quite surprised that so many people want to learn writing you know, during this multimedia age when I keep thinking that everyone wants to do video and podcasts, but there's still such an enormous interest in writing, which is very gratifying um, for me. So thank you uh, for, for joining. I'm just going to try and share my screen uh, with you. Yep, you got that? Yes, that's good okay. you. Great. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm going to just talk about um, how to write with the style and flair of the world's best journalists. And I just want to uh, share the formula that I use and which I teach to a, a lot of people um, at the moment. But before I do that, could I just, uh, Frankie told me that it's possible to do a quick poll on here. And I'm yep. just very curious about how you see your own writing uh, at the moment. How many of you think you're a bad writer? How many of you think you're an average writer? And how, how many of you think that you're an awesome writer? 
So we just want to gauge that. Yeah. Make sure that uh, we can getting, see that the okay. love right phrase right there. Sixty one. Wow, there are a few few awesome ones here as well. Some of them say <laughs> twenty seven. Is that you, Jeffrey? Yeah. I don't get to vote. <laughs> no, you don't get to vote. Okay. So most are saying that you're average writers, yeah? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's, that's pretty good. I used to think that I was a good writer when I um, graduated from, from university. And it was only when I became a journalist that I realized mm -hmm. that, uh, that I wasn't anywhere near as good as I thought I was. Because I learned a lot during my time as a journalist that made me realize what a huge gap there is between how good you, you might think you are and how good it's really possible uh, to be. Um, as Frankie mentioned, I've been a journalist for 20 years. I was a journalist for 20 years. I was you know, written for The Economist, for The Financial Times, for Bloomberg News. Um, but my last job in journalism was an, as an editor for The Wall Street Journal, where I also trained uh, people there. And as Frankie said, now I'm a writing instructor full time for the past five years or so I have been and I teach people how to write with that same kind of style of, of, of great uh, journalists. Um, now, I just want to explain how it all began, because while I was an editor at the Wall Street Journal, I was asked one day to 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 teach uh, other staff reporters and editors across Asia. And I realized that I didn't really have a methodology uh, to teach because I, I, was, I knew I could write well, but I didn't really have a, any kind of a system. So what I decided to do was keep notes of the changes that I would make to uh, a reporter's copy that I was editing. And I thought then I'd be able to share those findings with, with them and, and in that way help them to, to write to a higher standard. When I started doing this, though, I realized I was just having hundreds of edits, different edits, and they seemed like they didn't make sense. There were just so many different things I would do. But when I looked closer at the kind of changes I would make uh, to a piece of writing, I realized that I only really made four types of changes. And that was really fascinating to me when I first observed that. I would make the writing more simple. That was, I did a bunch of changes that would make it writing more simple than it was because it was unduly complicated. Um, I made the writing more clear in, in places where it was confusing or baffling or just somehow difficult to understand. The third thing I did, I, was make, I would make the writing more elegant, by which I mean I would make it flow more nicely. And the fourth thing I did, I also made it more evocative, which just means, you know, more moving or more uh, more visual. So in order to evoke people's imagination or their emotions. And I realized that, you know, all the different changes would fall into those four categories. And I was so impressed with that um, <laughs> discovery that I began to refer to this as the secret source of good writing. So those concepts are simplicity, clarity, elegance, evocativeness. And I think those are concepts that if you use this framework to assess your writing, you'll be able to diagnose what's wrong with it very easily. And you'll be able to fix things uh, very easily as well. Uh, because it basically covered everything that I would do to turn an average piece of writing into an exceptional piece of writing that was fit to be published in a newspaper like the Wall Street Journal. And when I reflected on it, it made sense why this should be because when you simplify things, when you simplify the writing, it makes it more punchy. And that was one kind of effect that, that these changes would have, because sometimes writing would be slow and heavy. And when I, when I simplified it, it would make it more punchy. So that would have a big dramatic effect on the, on the, on the quality of the writing. Clarity was the ingredient that made the writing easy to understand, which is really important. There's no point writing stuff which people don't understand. So I would make those changes to make things clearer. Um, elegance is the, is the quality or the ingredient that makes your writing flow beautifully. And evocativeness is the uh, ingredient that makes your writing stimulating. So when you think about it, that's where the magic happens. If you can do those four things, you've pretty much got everything you need to make a piece of writing 
really good. A uh, simple way I, I, I help people to remember it, simplicity makes your writing ping, clarity makes your writing ring, elegance makes your writing sing, and evocativeness makes your writing zing. So if you, it's a kind of easy way of remembering what each ingredient brings to a piece of writing. Now, you can see how it, you could apply it to even just a, a sentence and, and improve it, right? So uh, using this framework. So if you look at this sentence, it was indicated to the president by his chief advisor that it should be attempted to formulate a decision to act at the earliest opportunity in the best interests of circumventing what might otherwise result in the country flowering into embarking on a prolonged, extended, and exorbitant military conflagration. Now, is that simple? Is it clear? Is it elegant? And is it evocative? And you'll find that, I mean, if you agree, it's, it's not really any of those things to any, 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 any decent uh, degree. So, just want you to think, I know it's, we can't really do exercises in this kind of forum, um, but I just want you to think if you applied those four ingredients, I mean, if you tried to make that sentence simpler, clearer, more elegant and more evocative, how might you do it? And I'll just give you one minute just to think about it. You're not necessarily going to come up with answers, but just think about applying that framework. How could you make it more simple, clear, elegant, evocative? It's important to just get your mind moving in this direction and that's why I'm asking you to do this. Don't worry if you can't find a solution. So if you had a chance to think about it and you've got your mind moving in that direction, um, you know, if I was to do it, I would probably, you know, it would come something like this. The president's chief advisor urged him to act quickly to avert a long, costly war. And there I've taken that sentence and simplified it, made it more clear, uh, made it a bit more elegant and a bit more evocative. And that's just with a simple uh, sentence. So that's the kind of impact that you want to be having on the different piece of writing that you're working with. If you apply those things and you start to have sentences that are much more, uh, uh, have, have those four ingredients in them, the piece of writing as a whole is going to become more engaging to read, which is very much unlike the first version of that sentence. Now, just want you to think about which of those four ingredients would you say is the most lacking in your writing? Because this is what you need to think about. Do you, where, where, where is the weakness in your writing? Do you think you could improve the simplicity of it? Do you think you could improve the clarity of it? Do you think you could improve the elegance of it? And could you, could you improve the evocativeness of it? So I want you to just have a think about that. If you want, you can put it into the chat box where you think which, of, which ingredient you think is most lacking in your writing. And frankly, later, if you see any interesting patterns, just let me know, okay? Sure, um, Johnny. So I now want to go into each of these ingredients one by one. So simplicity, the reason why a lot of our writing isn't as simple as it, as, it, as, it, as it should be, in my view, is because at school and at college, we're often encouraged to use big words, uh, long, complicated sentences, which are kind of designed to make us feel more intelligent, a bit more smart. We, we make this assumption that in order to be smart and sound smart, we need to use big words and complicated sentences. And the thing with, with, with newspapers, when I got into writing for newspapers, is that they encourage the complete opposite, which is, you know, few words as possible, minimum number of words necessary to make a point. Uh, plain language where possible, because you want people to quickly grasp what you're saying. And uh, simple sentences, which are not unduly complex. And this creates the opposite effect of writing that is, as I said before, light and punchy. So that's kind of what we're aiming for with simplicity. And there are a couple of tactics I can share with you. Um, one way is to cut unnecessary words. Um, to make your writing more simple. Another way is to use plain language. So let's look at cutting unnecessary words. And this is an example I, I often use in, in the talks I do this. Put in, into the chat box which of these words you think is unnecessary. Because when you start thinking about every single word that's in your writing, you can see opportunities to cut that you didn't see. 
imagine this is a sign in a fishmonger's and you're standing there looking at this sign, fresh fish sold here. Which of these words, if you thought about it, technically you wouldn't need, of course you need a sign in a fishmonger's, but just, we're just doing this as an exercise. It's one that's often used in journalism, which is right. the most obvious word that you think could be deleted. Eric said, fresh, Julie said, fresh, any chance they saw here, Sophie Clark says, so here, let Joe say, so. Okay. Yeah. Usually the one that people most obviously get is here, because if you're reading a sign and you're there already, you don't really need to say that you are here. Um, then you would look at the word soul, because if you really think about it, well, no one gives fish away for free, right? So there's not, you don't need to say that it's being sold, strictly speaking. And you don't need, really need to say fresh either because, you know, who would, no, no one markets selling stale fish. So, you know, you don't technically need to say that it's fresh either. Um, and then they say, well, you don't really need to say fish because if you're standing right there by the sign, you could probably smell the fish anyway. So you don't technically need a sign at all. Now, it's just a, a fun example just to kind of show that only when you start thinking about these individual words do you start to see opportunities to cut. You do... The way to cut words is to think, do I need that particular word in this sentence at all? And if you don't, try removing it and see what happens and you'll get that punchy effect uh, as, you, as you tighten and tighten and tighten the sentence. Now, obviously don't do it to such an extent that it loses its meaning, but there are a lot of bloated sentences that you can deal with, like this one. Becky, please have a talk with Sheila at some point and ask her what she thinks about Mark's idea about how to redesign the current logo and then get back to me and let me know what she says. Now, that's a really bloated, long-winded way of saying something much more simple. And if you apply your mind to that and start thinking about which words you can do without, which phrases you can do without, you could end up with something much simpler, uh, like, Becky, please let me know what Sheila thinks of Mark's new logo design. So I want to encourage you to get that punch. Can you see the difference in the kind of impact those sentences have when you apply this concept of simplicity and cutting unnecessary words in particular? Now, you can go really far with this. Um, this is an example I use in one of my courses. The specific point I'm seeking to make here is that the colors red and gray go well together. Now, if you just looked at that, you know, it, it seems a bit long-winded, but you, know, you, you might think that everything you say there is necessary. Well. Of course, here you don't need to say again, you know, so you could just say the specific point I'm seeking to make is that the colors red and gray go well together. Well, you need to say specific point because all points are specific, aren't they? So the point I'm seeking to make is that the colors and red, red and gray go well together. But do you need to say uh, the point I'm seeking to make? You just say the point. My point is that the colors red and gray go well together. So you've tightened it even more. Uh, the colors red and gray, you don't even need to say that it's my, uh, my point because it's obvious that it's a point already. You are making a point, you don't need to say you're making a point. So the colors red and gray go well together. Well, red and gray are colors, aren't they? You don't need to be told that uh, the red and gray are colors. Red and gray go well together. And if they go well together, they match. So you can see how much real estate you've saved by <laughs> from that really long-winded sentence down there, but it happens because you are questioning every single word. Do I need to say that? Do I need to say that? Do I need to say that? And as you get into that practice, you know, you're gonna get this impact coming through in your writing. Um, there are some low-hanging fruit you can do with this, which is like commonly twinned words you need to look out for. Like the companies discuss the potential for a joint collaboration. Well, People say that like out of habit, but a collaboration is always done jointly, right? So you could just say potential for a collaboration. Uh, future plans. We'd like to learn more about your future plans. Well, plans are always in the future, aren't they? So you could just say, we'd like to learn more about your plans. Um, he received an unexpected surprise. Well, all surprises are unexpected, so you don't need that. So you just tune yourself to noticing when something is said unnecessarily and you can cut, 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 and then you're gonna get that impact that news, good newspapers have. Why the ju writing jumps out at you is because it's tight and springy and punchy. So 
So this is just one of the impacts. Now, the second kind of way you can simplify your writing is, is to avoid words that make your writing feel heavy. Uh, you know, like it's very rare that you'd need to use words like comments, um, exhibit, utilize, implement, conceptualize, initiate. Just have a think about, I'm not saying never use these words. There are some occasions where it's okay, but just, just to think about this, right? It, they're heavy. They're quite heavy words for which you can change to kind of shorter, snappier type of language, plainer language. So just think of what could you say instead of comments? What could you say instead of exhibit? Utilize. Implement. It's a bit harder. Conceptualize. Initiate. And I don't know if you came up with any of these, but you know, start, show, use, put in place, imagine, begin, right? And you'll find that when you start replacing these words, then your text starts to lose that sense of going through quicksand to get to, to understand the idea. It just jumps at you, flies into your consciousness rather than kind of swimming slowly, right? Um, you can really see this in action. Like, you know, I have seen many uh, resumes or cover letters which I've edited, uh, you know, which have this type of language because people think it makes them sound intelligent, but it really is quite pretentious and, and slow, slow moving. Should you determine my extensive and considerable experience to be appreciably worthwhile to your cor corporation and its long-term traje trajectory, I shall be pleased to invoke an acquaintance with you at the soonest opportunity within the parameters of an interview. Now, is that really impressive? Or would it be more impressive to just say, I look forward to an interview if you think my background and experience are suitable, which is professional, it's polite, and it just avoids all of this uh, sort of pre pretentious uh, nonsense. And it's, again, lighter and punchier, much more engaging to read. Or you may see link LinkedIn profiles like this. I will assist your website to actualize more recognition and visibility in a manner that will enhance your traffic flow and monetization efforts through conversions. Now, does that really help your communication? Does it make your writing more engaging or easy to understand even? And how could you make it less heavy? Well, you could just say, I'll help drive traffic to your website and turn more visitors into buyers. And that's gonna be far more uh, effective as a piece of communication. So I really wanna encourage you to, to go down this route. Um, so those are like the simplicity, some simplicity tactics that you can immediately begin to, to think about and implement in your writing. I said implement there. <laughs> Um, and the second ingredient is, is clarity. And, and, and this is probably the most important ingredient because if your writing isn't clear to begin with, then there's no point dressing it up in other ways. You could, you know, if you're trying to make it more pretty by making it more elegant and more, uh, you know, more stylish, more, more evocative, um, or more simple, it's no point if it's not, if it remains unclear. So you, this is more like the foundation stone. And it really is hard to communicate. I saw this example once shown by someone else. You know, even a simple sentence like, I didn't say she stole my money can be interpreted seven different ways, right? I didn't say she stole my money. 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 Could, you know, could all have different meanings. Now, of course, within context in writing, you know, you don't have to panic about that. But in general, just to understand how, how important it is to be clear about your meaning. And the, the two clarity tactics I'll give you, um, you know, fuzzy thinking is often the cause. It's just that you haven't thought through your idea uh, clearly enough. Um, and uh, the second um, one I'll come to is, is, is ambiguity. But fuzzy thinking is kind of ends up with writing like this, which, and I've, this is an exaggerated one, but imagine a, a blog post that says, world renewed author Jack, Jake Bliss said today, nine days is a book that was mostly written in the basement during a book signing, although with a few chapters that would have been written in a nearby park. Now it's just really, really hard to understand what that is trying to say not only there's a mistaken word world renewed instead of 
world renowned, I think is what the writer means to say. The mixed up tenses is, was, would have been, that's also contributing to the, to the fuzziness. Um, it, it's not clear whether it's his own book, we could just say is a book. Um, it, the book title is not clear because it could be, you know, you haven't really, the writer hasn't really identified the title of the book clearly enough. Uh, it could be today nine days or it could be nine days. Um, the uh, the during a book signing phrase in there, um, presumably he said this during a book signing, but the way where, where it's placed in the sentences creates a lot of fuzziness as well. So this is a deliberately exaggerated one, but look for those similar types of problems um, that might come up. If you were to write it in a clear way, you might say something like, at a book signing today, world-renowned author Jake Bliss said, most chapters in his new book, Nine Days, were written in his basement and the rest in a nearby park. Presu making presumptions about what he was really, uh, the, the, sorry, the author was really trying to say. Um, okay, so watch out as well for misplaced words. You know, this, this, these things can slip through the net. Marcus almost studied 10 hours for the exam versus Marcus studied almost 10 hours for the exam and those two just have if you just misplace the word almost it's a completely different meaning because it, it, this is the first one means that marcus almost studied uh 10 hours though so he could have not studied at all um whereas marcus studied almost 10 hours for the exam tells you the amount of time that uh, that he uh, actually uh, studied so the the placing of words is very very important um now onto the the, the question of ambiguity, it's very easy to be misunderstood. If you said Lex called to talk about the meeting yesterday, what's the ambiguity there? Just have a think. Did Lex call yesterday or was the meeting yesterday? Right? It, the, the way it's written, it could mean either. So you have to fix stuff like that. Uh, to make it clear what you're doing. Lex called yesterday to talk about the meeting or Lex called to talk about yesterday's meeting. There you pinning down your meaning. And these were little things that I would have to catch as an editor, uh, you know, in people's writing because then people could read it, our readers could read it and, and just not be sure. They'll get confused, you know, what, when did this happen? We're not quite sure. So you've got to nail it down, pin down the meaning. The friendship between Leonard and Mark hasn't been the same since he left town. Well, you've got two people mentioned and which, which, which of the two left town? Assuming it was uh, uh, Leonard, you know, you'd have to rephrase it somehow. So since Leonard left town, his friendship with Mark hasn't been the same. So there are ways you can restructure sentences and make things clearer. So ambiguity is just something you've really got to look out for. Finally, just be careful with punctuation. Um, a, a, a tiny comma can change the meaning <laughs> completely. So, you know, did you eat mother and did you eat mother have two very different uh, meanings, right? Uh, one more sinister than the other. Or as the, the title of that book goes, the panda eats shoots and leaves is a description of what a panda eats. But if you put a comma after eats, it becomes the panda eats shoots and leaves which sounds like a uh, Kung Fu Panda or something, right? So it's like a, it's, it's, it's a more sinister uh, type, of, type of interpretation. So you need to become aware of these small details that can change the meaning of what you're saying, all right? So that's with simplicity and clarity, and I hope you're beginning to see how important they are towards you know, creating high quality writing. Um, elegance is, is that ingredient though that takes it to the artistic level right? Where now you're going from it just being clear, you know, punchy and, 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 and sharp to having kind of music. And that's where, you know, not many people know how to do that because it's very hard to explain as well. Now, the quality of elegance I look at in two ways. One is in terms of the structure of the writing, the, the organization of ideas in a piece of writing in an elegant way. So that's why I'm talking about the arrangement of ideas in anything you're writing, whether it's like a, a cover letter or, or, or a work report or whatever, or a blog post. And secondly, the rhythm of the writing, which is the way the actual writing moves in terms of its music. Um, and those are two 
big parts of elegance. Um, so if you learn to organize your ideas elegantly and give your writing rhythm, you're going to have a big impact on top of the, the simple simplicity and clarity uh, elements. Now, I often explain this through the idea of a cover letter. Think of you're writing a cover letter for a job and there are certain categories of information that you're providing. Um, you're going to, you know, you're going to say at some point, perhaps what you think you can bring to the role that's on offer. Um, what you're seeking, which is an interview, uh, uh, an opportunity for an interview. Um, you say why you're applying for the job, the reasons for, for applying, um, and details about your, your relevant background and experience. Now, those are all four, four categories that might go into a piece of, uh, into a cover letter. But if you organized it the way that I've organized it there, it's not going to be very elegantly um, delivered. You know, what I think I could bring to the role. Yes, I want an interview. Um, I'm applying for the job for this reason. This is my relevant background and experience. It, it wouldn't flow as elegantly as, for example, you know, why I'm applying for the job, my relevant background and experience, what I think I could bring to the role and what I'm seeking, which is an interview. Now, there's no one way to do it. And maybe you could make the first structure work uh, elegantly, depending on how you tie the ideas together. But it's just something you want to think about is, whatever you're writing, what are the blocks of ideas? So you want to identify the blocks of ideas that you're moving through and then arrange them elegantly so that they flow into each other in the best possible way. So it's good to even just write down category one, category two, they're sections. And you'll find that then builds elegance into the structure of your writing and that begins to enhance it and make it stand out. And the second uh, way, as I mentioned, is to give your writing more rhythm. Now, it's really hard, especially in a short lecture like this, to explain the concept of rhythm. It's kind of like, you know, if you try to teach someone how to dance or tap to a beat, it's very hard to do that in a, in a kind of intellectual way and say, look, you, this is how you do it. It's more a feeling. You've got to get a feel for it. You've got to study writing that flows well. And, and understand the rhythm of it. So I, of, I, I often give the example of something that's, that's on the extreme end of that, which is closer to poetry, um, where you know, you've got this um, speech from Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a desert state, sweltering with the heat of injustice and oppression will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the, by the content of character. Now, he may not have read it exactly as I did, but you can see that there's a music in it, right? And I'm not saying you need to make your cover letters uh, read like poetry. I'm just saying that uh, you, you, if you develop a sensitivity to the music of, of, of your language, that's a little further element that you can add to it to make it. Now, if you read even good newspapers, you'll see that there's a certain rhythm to good feature articles where, you know, the mixture of short and long sentences, the use of punctuation to get the, the, the rhythm going. Uh, it's something that I would just encourage you to study. Think about read really good newspapers like The Economist and just uh, uh, in the Wall Street Journal and just look at how they uh, pace their sentences. And that really is, you know, makes you stand out. Um, with, the, with the Dr. King's speech, you, know, you could see almost put beats in there. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slavery will be able to sit down together at a table of brothers. You could, you could apply beats like that. There's different ways of applying it, but there's, there's definitely music in it. So it's just something that I want you to think about. The other thing in, 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 in the case of rhythm is monotony, right? So you, you can have um, like news articles often sometimes will just be really monotonous because they use the same subject verb pattern again and again and again. So Trico said in a statement Tuesday that it had bought Sunrise Technologies. The deal is worth 20 billion. The software company said the acquisition would help it target consumers in Asia. It added that the move would give a significant boost to its profit this year. Sunrise is the world's second biggest chip maker. Trico is a US-based company. Sunrise is, is based in Taiwan. So you can see that that's a really boring, um, no, so it's kind of inelegant pattern of, 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 of phrasing sentences. Whereas 
if you varied that and tried to change the structures around a little bit, you might get something more like Trico bought Sunrise, Trico bought Taiwan Sunrise Technologies in a deal worth 20 billion. In a statement Tuesday, the US software company said the acquisition would help target Asian consumers, adding that the move could significantly boost this year's profit. Sunrise is the world's second biggest chip maker. So I'm just, uh, I just want to encourage you to look at the different ways in order to bring in this sort of elements of rhythm. You can, you can uh, mix and match information in order to create more varied um, structures to your writing. Again, improving the rhythm, getting rid of monotony. And finally, evocativeness. Now, you can, you can get by uh, well enough with um, simplicity, clarity, and elegance if you're just writing like professional business writing, right? Um, it, you can get, you can, you can, that would be enough. But when you add evocativeness into it as well, which is this thing that gives imagery and passion and color and drama to what you're writing, that's when writing starts to have flair. And it can, it can work well even in, in business writing to kind of raise it to a higher level. But it's particularly good in, with blog writing and article writing to add this, this ingredient into it as well. Um, and two tactics I'll give you. One is to focus on the players and action uh, as where possible. And secondly, to bring out the drama that's inherent in something. Now, the first thing, players and action. Now, if you read, you, you, you'll understand what I mean if I give you this kind of sentence, which you might see in a lot of bureaucratic writing, um, you know, in, in, in universities or, or, no, I don't mean like, I mean, talking about like um, administrative types of writing. So high powered jobs are likely to become more accessible upon graduation if coursework is attended to diligently over the next three years. And there's really no life in it because you can't really find the players, you can't really find the action very easily. And, and you know, you, you get a lot of this type of writing in organizations, say in government uh, organizations, where um, it's very abstract because it's not focusing on, on, on players like people or, and what they're doing. So when you come across these kind of sentences, which are really horrible and not engaging to read at all, um, just by adding the players and the action in there, you can make it sort of start to sound a bit better. So students who apply themselves diligently to their coursework over the next three years will find it easier to land high powered jobs once they graduate. So you can see the students and you can see them applying themselves diligently. And you've just changed this kind of horribly technical and abstract sentence into a much more human and personalized one. So it's just look out for opportunities like that where your writing is coming across as too abstract. Um, and finally, bringing out drama. This idea is, um, it's not appropriate for everything and, and I'm not saying exaggerate or sensationalize, but I just wanna show you the, the process. If you saw a news article that said, police took strong measures to confront the violent and disorderly conduct of dozens of people assembled at last night's protest, uh, which is okay in terms of like it's telling us what happened. But let's say you had details of how that protest went and what really took place and, and you help people to visualize what was happening in a dramatic way uh, while staying true to what really happened. You might end up with something like mounted officers and police dogs battled throughout the night with dozens of angry bottle wielding protesters. So there, what you've done is you, you're focusing in on the detail and the color of the incident to make that sentence much more um, evocative and stimulating uh, to read. So I've taken these kind of extreme examples, but just so that you can begin to think about how you can apply these four concepts of simplicity, clarity, elegance, and evocativeness to your writing. So just to quickly summarize that, um, the four ingredients, burn them into your brain, simplicity, clarity, elegance, evocativeness. When you put them all together, that is when the magic happens. And I assure you, these are the concepts that I was using to create you know, uh, you know, compelling stories for, 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 for big newspapers. Um, and just finally, I'll say there are, those are some of the tactics, there are more, there's like, there are, there are many ways you can simplify your writing, make it more clear, make it more elegant. And I've kind of mapped these out 
um, in my course, um, Writing with Flair, if any of you are interested. I also got a free course which on Udemy, which goes through some of this stuff that I've gone through today as well. Um, but I also want to say that you don't just apply these ingredients um, like, a, like technically, like in a mechanical way, you've got to be a bit artistic about it. Sometimes you have to play off one ingredient against another because you might be able to get something really simple, but then it's so simple that it doesn't, it's not evocative. So then you have to add words back in to give it that evocative, um, evocativeness as well, or elegance to make it, because it might sound a bit stilted. So it's a kind of an artistic balancing that has to go on. Um, if you want to know more about these things, yes, you can visit those um, platforms or my website, shaniraja.com. But finally, I just say, to help you sort of uh, work with these new ideas, whenever you read something, always ask yourself, to what extent is this simple, clear, elegant, and evocative? And whenever you write something, after you've written it, always ask, is this as simple, clear, elegant, and evocative as it can be. And I'm pretty sure that if you do those, that repeatedly and study it in that way, that your writing will soon begin to be more, uh, more uh, um, um, higher quality than it was before and probably higher quality than a lot of other writing in your field or profession. Um, so I hope that has been helpful. I hope I'm on time there, Frankie. Am I okay there? Um, yeah, okay. we're on track. Uh, we okay for time? Yes. Yeah, uh, and 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have. I hope it was useful. Yep. Um, everyone, if you got a question, um, you can ask anything to Johnny while he's here. I receive a lot of. Um, Positive words, Sunny, about oh. this course. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's probably quite, quite a lot for people to take in. Um, yeah. Hey, Jenny. Yes. Sorry, uh, just a quick question. Like, that's a really great presentation. Like, it's amazing. Like, um, um, how in a short presentation there is so much good content for us to learn. Um, are you going to, are you going to share the slide with us? Like, if so, do you have like platform that we can access so we can go through it over again uh, or at our own pace yep sure um, I, I'm happy to give it to um, these guys um, at PDF and uh, yeah. and yeah uh, they can they can distribute it uh, as they see fit yeah if, if people want that yeah and and also like you mentioned that you have a course in Udemy and LinkedIn but do you also have like some other content or material that could be helpful for us outside of uh, Udemy or LinkedIn? Outside of Udemy or LinkedIn? Um, I mean, yes, there are, on my website, there are um, some resources, um, like for example, uh, articles that I have written or podcasts that I've uh, been on, um, including one with you, with Jeffrey there, um, where, we go, I go into more detail into some of these concepts and, and, and you look more closely at the mindset uh, of, a, of, of a good writer. I, there's one particular podcast um, which I did, um, uh, which, is, which is high up on that, which I think was, was, was a really good one, which goes into, into, into some more detail into some of these concepts. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'll you. definitely have a look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Jeffrey here, uh, could I just it's squeezing the question so mm. you know the process that we went through which is sort of sort of sit down and you edit a piece of my work which is eventually how i sort of got these concepts right mm. so just going through your talk there i mean what, what um what is the best way for someone that hasn't sort of been through that process in order to learn uh these four concepts and how do you how do you start off applying that into your writing yeah i mean as as i, as I said uh, at the end there that it's really you have to the first first step is I would I would was the question I asked before was what is the weakness that you have in your writing like you really need to identify and I hope that like you should be able to say yeah problem with my writing it's not very punchy it's very slow and very heavy or the problem with our writing is that people don't understand it well one useful thing is to ask other people right so you could you could give your writing to to, to other people and say 
but ask them questions around whether it is, you know, stimulating. Is it, is it, is it, is it clear enough? And clarity is a real big problem. Like if there's anything that people don't understand, sometimes we think that people understand what we mean and then when, but they're really not understanding it. And it's really helpful to do that. Uh, uh, other great way to, to, to improve your writing quickly is to edit yourself, other people's writing. So you can do this with friends or family, or you could do even go on the internet and find copy uh, that's there and, um, and, 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 and then try to edit it. Because when you're looking at other people's writing, you tend to be more objective mm. about it. And then you start to see, because when you write it yourself, you get your, your, you've got your emotions involved and your ego involved. But here you're editing up. So edit as many uh, people's writing as possible um, to do that. I, and on YouTube, I've got a video which, which does actually help with editing, like a nine step editing system, which, which I think is quite useful as well to show the process of editing something. Um, but these four ingredients are something you should always keep at the front of your mind because they, they really are the, the, you know, that identifies all the problems that could happen in a really easy way. Right. The problem there is that people may not know how to fix some of those issues of simplicity. I've given a couple of tactics there for each uh, uh, ingredient, but there are there there are more. So I mean, it's it's useful to, to 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 learn the others as well. But you can do it yourself. It would just take longer. But if you use that framework, that lens, you're gonna you're gonna go up that learning curve much faster. Because basically, it's 20 years of experience it took me to to discover this. <laughs> Right, so I've kind of like giving you the shortest route to, to, to copywriting mastery um, by saying these are the things you need to look for. Yeah, and certainly from my point of view, it, it's like you've actually put it into a, a, a set of rules and, and codified it like a science. So mm. that, you know, it's, it, for people who don't, for people who are left-brained, you know, people who are more sort of analytical and, and maths inclined, uh, it's harder for us to grapple with the artistry of, of writing, right? So we need a set of rules to, to at least put some structure around how we improve our writing. And I think what you've done is you've actually created these rules so it's easy for us to see the patterns in order to improve our writing. Um, and, and I think, you know, some people obviously are, are more um, uh, talented in terms of the, the, the language side of things and they can mm -hmm. just understand and have a good feel for it. For mm -hmm. the rest of us, you know, these set of rules are very helpful. That's right. And to see them as rules, like they, they help you to, to write artistically. So I'm not, just because you know the science of it doesn't mean your writing cannot be artistic. It's about how you balance them is where the artistry comes in. So you can choose whether to in a particular piece of writing, if your goal is one thing, you can choose, you know, to what extent should I bring simplicity into it? To what extent should I bring clarity? It's good to optimize each of these things and then balance them. But there are going to be some times where, you know, you might need to be a bit more formal um, and so on, depending on your, on your purpose. But that's where each time you're, you're still, there's still room in this system to be artistic and creative. Um, it's not just kind of deducing everything to, to say that you know you have to mechanically apply these principles you have to work with them like a chef like a master chef right so a little bit of ingredient uh, simplicity here not but it's too much there so i need to balance it out with a little bit of elegance uh, or evocativeness so this will seem quite abstract if you just learn this system but as you practice it's going to start making more and more sense to you and you're going to know how to turn this kind of average piece of writing to really start to put the bells and whistles and to sing out. Hi, Shani. I have a question for you. Hey, uh, James. First off, thanks for your presentation. I found it very insightful and great. Um, you. I mentioned right at the beginning that it was great to see so many people keen on improving their writing, given that the world is moving to podcasts and that sort of thing. Yeah. Keen to hear from your perspective, because I sense there's a lot of passion um, within you for writing, um, from your perspective, why it's so important to write well and write clearly. Sorry, why? It's so important to write well and write clearly. Yeah, I mean, uh, during this particular time, when people do still, still read a lot, um, you know, online, there is a great potential 
for people to be like never before have just the, the ordinary masses been able to become so influential without the help of a newspaper or without the help of a publisher right this is an unprecedented time if if you might have great ideas uh that could change the world but if you cannot express and articulate that in a way that is engaging for people uh then your influence is going to be limited so i think the the, the great thing here what i'm trying to do here is to, is to empower all these people who might have great ideas, but who lack that expertise in, of the craft to say, well, how can I make this just really, really engaging for people? Because if they, if they may have the best ideas in the world, but if they can't write in an engaging way, uh, unless they're speaking it, but if they can't write in an engaging way, their influence is always going to be limited. So I think it's a really powerful uh, way of if you know how to write like the best journalists in the world, then you've got a better chance of having your ideas heard and shared. Um, so I think it's empowering people with great ideas to take part in the the global conversation, you know, and 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 have their voice heard. All right. Thank you, Shani. Thank you, Jane, for questions. Um, I got a couple of questions. To the I've got three questions. Just on some of times. Um, mm. One of the questions come from. Pick two. Um, Tick, do you want to ask that question directly? Okay, let me let me read it then. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, Siani, for the great talk. But I do think there might be some context where the four for the four tactics listed might not be as useful. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? such as legal area or policy? Yes, yes. Uh, like there's going to be some cases where with, with legal documents, for example, you're going to have to have a bunch of uh, boring technical words uh, in there because it's important to be precise. So the need for clarity uh, over, overpowers the need for any of the other ingredients. So depending on your purpose, like I said, it's always a balancing that you need to do depending on the purpose of the writing. So, uh, but within that context, you can still make it as engaging as possible, but without losing, you know, but, but the, per, the qu person who asked the question is absolutely right. There are some contexts in which, like in, but in academic writing, for example, I think you can do, you can go a long way with simplifying things. People think that you have to make it really fancy language and everything to get good marks. Maybe that's true in some cases, but I think sometimes it's more important just to communicate your idea really well and not overcomplicate things which are simple. By the same token, you don't oversimplify things which are genuinely complicated, right? But you don't overcomplicate things which are very simple. So yes, there is balancing that, that should go on and you should definitely look at it in terms of the conventions and the expectations of people in that field, but aim to communicate brilliantly using these four principles. All right, thank you. Thank you mm. for uh, asking the question so quick. And uh, Siani, I got another question from mm. PY. Can I just invite PY if you can ask the questions? Hi, Shani. Hello. Hi, frankly. Yeah, Hello. thanks for um, organizing this and your useful sharing as well, Shani. Okay, Thank my you. question is actually basically, right, um, so like, for example, when you write to uh, management, um, yeah. Because a case is that they want to have something which is quick and fast and provide the overview, but yet at the same time, some of the time, they, they, some of the time they may want you no know, details that track along with it. So how do you actually balance and write something which is punchy that when you read it, they will understand yeah. the overview and yet, you know, uh, in case they need the details, you can, you know, uh, also include in there, but not in an overly loading of information manner. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the thing to understand. It's not a, a simplicity versus details. Like details, if you need the details there, you got to put the details there. It's how you write the details that's important, right? So you write it in a way that's not overblown, uh, long-winded and unnecessarily complex, right? So uh, you, yeah, you've got to decide what the purpose of this communication 
is to inform my boss of these things. If the detail needs to be there, the detail needs to be there. It's not about that because that's to do with the content, right? And as long as you're not repeating and you're not rambling, uh, the detail needs to go there. But you can simplify the way that you express those details uh, without sounding, but you've got to take account of the tone and you've got to take account of other things. And that's where evocativeness comes in, right? You don't want to, if you were just going to go for just pure simple, then it would might come across as rude, right? If you're writing an email and you just kind of just state the facts, right? In, a, in as short a way as possible. No, but sometimes you need to warm them up and you need to say things like, you know, I hope everything's going well, you know, depending on the purpose and the relationship that you want to cultivate, but you're doing all of these things consciously. I'm just talking about having hot air that is kind of useless and makes a piece of writing hard to get through and difficult to read and not engaging to read, but all the other elements need to be there uh, to be, to be an effective piece of communication you don't want the boss to think you're, you're just rude, right? So you need, to, you need to butter them. You might need to butter them up unless they understand that, in which case they just want the, the facts one by one. But this is where communication is not mechanical, right? It's, it's you're, you're dealing with a person usually or people and you have to uh, relate and connect with that audience. And that will tell, and with your purpose, whatever your purpose is. And once you can connect your purpose with, with the people that you're, you're dealing with, then the tone, the pace, and the content of your communication should become clear. It, would, it, will, it will determine what that is and how you communicate it. But the tactics themselves can mean you don't have long-winded ways of saying things unnecessarily. But if it helps to, for the tone, then Include it. Does that answer the question? Hey, Shani, thanks. And also, uh, any quick tips on copywriting? Thank on copy you. On copywriting. Yeah, I mean, well, everything I've said is relates to copywriting as well, right? So um, I, I think, you know, having the, the, you know, the structure, especially like this is where most people go wrong is that they will just have a bunch of relevant points that they put down one after another, but they don't consider what's the best order for these points and how can we structure it so that they flow into each other best. So having that bird's eye overview of a particular long piece of content, if you're going into books, it's even more so, but to have that bird's eye view of the content and know the categories that you're going through, and then you can move and shift the categories around to give your writing the best um, flow. I'd say that's the most uh, kind of crucial thing that people miss. Frankie? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Okay, let's move to the next question from Roger Samuel. Roger got two questions. Roger, um, hi, Roger. Like hey. How you doing, man? Hey, Shani, long time no see. Yeah, how are you? Long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got two questions. Yeah. Um, first one, um, I appreciate you got four techniques there, yeah. um, but I'm always under time pressure at work and I'm just wondering if there's a way to um, apply those four techniques a lot quicker, um, you know, whether it's using some app like a, like a Grammarly or, or something that I can use to... Um, yeah, to apply the four techniques, um, but, but also to cut the amount of time I need to, to write effectively. Um, so, so that's the first question on time. And secondly, uh, on your fourth technique, which is, uh, which is the, which is the evocativeness, yeah. Yeah, yeah evocativeness. Mm -hmm. um, do you almost have to write the way that you say the words, if you know what I mean? Like, you know, say the words in your head and then you, and then you actually write it. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, let me try to deal with that. Uh, All right. Well, what I say anything about that, can I just um, make a short, not a short uh, announcement? Yeah. If you guys can fill up the short survey that I'm going to put it in the chat box, there's a link in there. That would be great for us. Thank you so much. Mm. So the first thing, Roger, you were asking about how to kind of write, write more fast. Um, 
And it kind of depends, again, what you're writing, right? If you're writing a quick note to investors, I know you were an analyst before, right? Like an equity analyst, were you? Yep, yep. Yeah. I'm still an equity analyst, yep. Right, so, so, so uh, sometimes, you know, if it's just a brief note to, 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 to clients on some thing, then all the elegant stuff and provocativeness stuff is perhaps less important than just getting the facts simple, clear out quickly as possible in bullet points. Sometimes that's going to be the... The way forward it's all about what your audience uh would most benefit from so uh it, you know if you're doing a nice report a big report then i think all the features of evocative clear simple and elegant all can come in to create a really great report that's better than the reports that other people from other companies um are producing because not many people have these sort of skills mm -hmm. Um, but again, always go to your purpose. Like if you're thinking, if you're thinking, I just want to write fast, right? Well, all of these tactics, once you practice them over and over, you'll get fast at doing them. There's no other way is just to kind of keep practicing them until they become second nature to you as they are for me. Um, so the more you practice, the easier that's going to be. But then always consider what does my audience need? What Sometimes they won't want uh, kind of uh, all this they just want a bullet point so it depends what it is that you're writing uh, there's no overarching rule for everything it's all specific to what you're producing and the purpose you're producing it for yeah sure. yep um the uh evocativeness question can you just remind me what that was again um oh it was like yeah did you have to almost uh say it in your head or you know or talk it out and then actually before you write it because then you can sort of sense whether it's, uh, it triggers any emotion or whether it's interesting enough. Yeah, great question. Yeah, um, you, yeah. Um, you, you don't have to say it out loud, but I, I think it through and I wait till I'm moved. Like, so let's take that example about the protest. I thought, mm. I tried to imagine what happened at the protest, right? And then I've, I, 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 I started to drill down into the detail of it. You see, rather than just saying, you know, a conflict occurred, well, what was the nature of that conflict? And when you start seeing bottle wielding protesters, it has a kind of a, a more of an em emotional or a visual impact on you because you're just seeing through from the abstraction into the detail of what is happening. And so you're visualizing it and you're also giving details that are more like it's quite shocking, it's quite moving. If that's what really happened, bottle wielding protesters, police dogs uh, battling throughout the night, it, you know, is a, is a, is a compelling um, image um, that is quite, uh, you know, that, that fires up your imagination. So how do you get to that is you've got to train yourself to see into the detail. So you kind of see more until you get to the point where the color and the imagery and the people and the, and the, and the events start to kind of uh, create this kind of picture in your mind. Yep. Again, it's something that you need to practice. Now, the closer you can get to that, you don't overdo it, particularly in an analyst report, but you can, you can, you can still use that. I mean, like I think it's under, underused in those kind of things because it's not to overdo it and be, be pretentious about it, but to go as far as it's legitimate to go, like even in a newspaper, right? It's, it's, it's good to say it's much, you, the reader goes away with a better impression of what happened if you've given the details, right? Yep. Um, so, you, you, you know, you, you've got to experiment with this. So what I've given is the framework. Now, you know the concepts to work with, right? Okay, where, where would you need to, to focus on evocativeness? Well, because you're writing, if you feel your writing is boring. If you read it and say, well, it flows nicely, it's simple, everyone can understand it, but it's just missing that spark, that kind of, mm -hmm. yeah? If yeah. that's where the problem is, and you feel for your communication, you'd benefit from that, having that quality, that's when you need to start exploring that and start saying, well, what, what is the detail in what I'm saying that mm. could be, give more imagery to the reader? And okay. emotion, emotion to yep. the reader. Yep, fantastic, thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Roger. Okay, I will take last question, uh, last one more last questions because we don't have enough time to uh, to 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 go to go through the next questions. Mm. So the last question from Stephen Stephen Lim. 
Steven, you want to ask directly? Okay, basically he asks, any tip of you when dealing with multi-language audience or readership? Mm, multi-language, yeah, I mean, I keep coming back to the same point, which is that your audience is really crucial and your aim, your purpose is really crucial, so your intention. So let's say your intention is to inform a group of people who, for whom English is not a first language, then obviously you're going to inform them about something. You're going to have to steer clear of language that could alienate them or that's going to go over their heads. It's not easy to do, like even in this, because you often don't know who's on. Like on a call like this, I don't really know who's going to come on. It's just pretty random. So it's hard to pitch my language. I probably, you know, use words which some people may not know and some people find too obvious and all of that. But when you're sitting down to write something, you go roughly, you know what your audience is, you know roughly their uh, level of understanding of the topic, you know their, their, their assumptions about the world, uh, and all kinds of things. The closer you can get to um, understanding that or, uh, you know, trying to understand it, the better your communication is going to be. So when you're communicating with people who may not know, then you've got to stay away from jargon that might be to do with stuff you know and from your culture. Um, you've got to, you know, you've got to use references that are less, um, you know, specific to your, to your culture. This happened at the Wall Street Journal when I was like, you know, in Australia, you'll understand you guys like um, uh, when you, this word confronting, right? When someone says something was confronting, um, that's a phrase that's often used in Australia. So I had put that into a Wall Street Journal story um, about something that was happening in Australia and referred to something as being confronting. And the editors in New York, uh, the Wall Street Journal editors in New York were like, what's this, what does this mean, you know? They were like, and I had to remove that reference because the readers in America are not gonna understand that, that phrase. I mean, you can't, might be able to work it out, but it's just not familiar to them. So you've got to really try to be mindful of your audience. And the closer, you, the, the better you get at doing that, the more your work is going to hit, your content's going to hit, um, hit the mark. So yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to, to start to be, a, to, to be sensitive to. All right, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thanks for the answer, Sani. That's really great. Yeah. Okay, this is really a fascinating talk, Sani. Thank you for the um, a great talk. And I'm sure everyone's got something helpful from the session as well. And can everyone give a clap together for Sunny? Um, <laughs> thank you, Sunny. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Shani. Thanks, Shani. I would like to also thank you so thanks much. Thank everyone. You so much, thank you. That's great. Thank also, you, Shani. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for attending this event. And also, we have an upcoming event on the next week. If you're interested to come, how to get yourself ready for a mentor with John and Natalie. So it will start at 7 p.m. Thursday, 10th of September. And then if you want to know about our upcoming event, please visit our website at www.professionalreformforum.org or our Facebook and LinkedIn. And please subscribe to our mailing list. And please don't forget to uh, fill up the survey that I just placed in the chat box. Thank you so much.